So we were talking about what to do for last month's presentation and this month's presentation and I keep telling people I'd like to try and do uh, some presentations on uh, interesting debugging. Debugging in terms of how to use WinDebug or debugging applications for which you don't have the source or maybe even hacking some things using debuggers. And none of that fits in a lightning talk and I didn't have anything ready for a full presentation, so I decided to try and kind of start at the beginning. Nate suggested just doing an introduction on x86 machine code or <clears throat> something of that nature, and I thought, well, maybe even a little smaller than that and a little earlier than that. So I have a presentation on the Turing machine, and it should be real short, but I think it's something everybody should know and understand if they're going to try anything at that level. So this is Alan Turing. If you Google images of him, I think there's one of him smiling. I think someone snapped it while he was laughing, otherwise he would never smile. Uh, this is pretty much what he looked like all the time. He's been gone for the better part of a century. He was working in World War II as a code breaker at Bletchley Park, which was an intelligence division for the British government doing uh, code breaking. He was a, a driving role there, had a brilliant mind, and was breaking codes generated by the German Enigma machine, which used basically a fancy f version of the CRC checksum. But it was heck to break, and they found ways of doing it, and they were very successful at it, in large part due to him. <clears throat> There's a movie about him. You've probably all heard of it. Maybe some of you have seen it. I haven't seen it, but... It's got some problems with accuracy. Yeah, possibly. And sort I've tried to avoid a lot of the details for the sake of accuracy and controversy, but he died amid controversy in 1954. But we're going to talk about some of his math theory. And it seems strange that I'm naming this Turing machine, but I'm talking about math theory. Well, that's the cool part about this. He described the Turing machine, and the Turing machine really is a branch of uh, uh, math theory. Automata theory is the understanding behind machines that can compute. And the point to computing is to solve problems using math. Lambda calculus, which was named and proposed by Alonzo Church, <clears throat> I think in 1930, is kind of where uh, physical solving of problems meets the stuff on the blackboard. And Alan Turing is kind of meeting in the same place from the other direction. He comes from the machine aspect of it. and. Lambda calculus is something like functional programming, and the Turing machine is something like uh, mechanical programming. Um, and they, they really are somewhere in the middle. Anything that, is a, that bridges this gap is usually called a universal model of completeness. <clears throat> this is not a Turing machine. If this comes up in your search, you did it wrong. And I swear half of the time I type in what I mean and somebody thinks that's what I meant and they correct me. Go back and tell it, no, I meant this. So the universal model of computation is anything that can be used to solve any computational problem. Anything that can be used to describe a solution to a computational problem. A Turing machine is important because it fits that bill. It can be used... Uh, a Turing machine can be built to solve any, uh, to execute any algorithm. And it <clears throat> is mathematical proof regarding computation according to a set of rules. A uh, set of rules is the, the execution of steps to compute the algorithm. Uh, those rules can vary depending on the Turing machine. He didn't describe a, uh, a single machine. He described a set of rules for something that would qualify your idea as a valid Turing machine. So those rules, as he described them, was he used the word tape, an infinite tape composed of singular units of serial data, just a big long row of units. And each unit contained a zero or a one, as he described it. I don't know that it necessarily has to be that way, but in its simplest form it would be. It would be one of only two states, and that's the way our current computers think about things because it's the simplest way to build a machine. So this tape would then have a reader and a, write, a reader, writer, and that's the machine. It would read the data in that unit, apply it to its state machine, and then optionally write out a new value to that unit, 
and then either move forward one space or backward one space. And that's it. Any problem that can be solved, any algorithm can be executed by a universal completeness method could be built as a Turing machine and solved as well. The finite state machine is the part that actually applies logic to it that's inside the machine, but finite just means that it's not intelligent. It has a, a fixed set, a limited, manageable, practical set of instructions that it knows how to carry out, or a number of states. And why do we care about a Turing machine? This guy died in 54. We didn't even have computers then, right? Well, he built some machines that were technically computers, but the important thing is his legacy is in every device that we own. Even our thermostats have Turing machines in them, for goodness sake. This is something we all need to know about. Both of these examples are Turing machines. One is useful, one is not. Both are super cool. I'm glad to have the one on the left, and I'm glad to not have the one on the right, but to each his own. Here is a visualization of the Turing machine. So on top you see the gray bar. It extends indefinitely in both directions. And the yellow part here is pointing to that third zero in that single unit. It contains all of the things I described before. Uh, it will read the zero. It will apply it to its state machine and change its state and optionally write a new value to that square and then move either one space to the left or one space to the right. And it doesn't know or care which so way. It's describing memory, right? Well, you would see uh, the tape is probably memory and the arrow is probably a CPU. So the actual instructions that are executed, the ability to do stuff with data is in the yellow triangle, is in the reader. And it occurred to me, well, how will a Turing machine work with just bits? You know, because I, I know some assembly. I know that generally with an 8-bit machine, I'll go with that because it's simple, you would read eight, byte, 8 bits and you would get a byte, and that byte would represent a command, an instruction, something to be executed. And then it would have 0, 1, or 2 parameters in most cases, or operands. But we're not reading a byte at a time. So how do you know to go and read... How do, you, how do you read a whole command if you're just doing one bit at a time? Is that really a Turing machine? Well, yes. And here's how it works. So there's not a lot of space on here for me to annotate, but I tried just a few different states here. So we start on the left, and the program begins. We read, and we get a single bit. State 100, which is the original state, the very first state that the machine starts in, will take that one, apply it to state 100. The state machine knows a few different things. It knows what state am I, what am I going to do about it when I get a zero, and what am I going to do about it when I get one. And when it's done, it knows which state it's going to be in at the end. So it'll take that one, and it will put it in a register, a one-byte register, in the least significant bits position. Now state 100 knows it has seven more bits that need to be read to make an 8-bit command. So it switches to another state, that says, I'm reading the second bit. And so there will be eight states to read an 8-bit command. Well, that sounds extraneous for an operation when we just want to read a byte, but as far as the Turing machine is convinced, the whole point to this is that the machine has described something that can be done. Whatever we want it to do, the Turing machine can do it. And as we demonstrate, yes, it can. It can even implement our microcontroller logic as, as implemented in hardware in the CPU. So it would go on to read an operand and possibly another operand, and all the while changing states in each <coughs> state may be as simple as just reading a bit, putting it in a register, and moving on to the next bit. Whereas when it gets to the end, it may do something more significant. That's up to the machine. So the point is that even though our CPUs may work a little bit differently than Turing described, they do fit his set of rules, and they are Turing machines. When something fits the rules, it is called Turing complete. We already covered this a little because somebody said it. The tape is RAM, the finite state machine is the CPU. And anything that is Turing complete means that it can be used to compute any algorithm. And that makes it very important 
because it means that we can take any problem and feed it into a single machine, a single computer, and it won't run into a wall that says, I'm not capable of doing this. Whatever code he wanted to break, he knew that the machine could do it, and he didn't need to have six different machines all specialized to encounter various circumstances. One machine could be set to compute anything he gave it. And uh, obviously, we don't run into many problems, many walls with our computers other than a finite set of tape and time. Pretty much everything else we can do one way or another. We just have to be creative about overcoming those two walls and then we can do anything we want with them. All modern CPUs are Turing complete. I couldn't find any evidence of one that was not. Uh, nearly all programming languages are Turing complete. I don't know which ones are not, I just know that I'm not using them. Uh, there's even a language out there that most of you might have heard of that nobody uses because it's ridiculous by its very foundation. It's called Brain F. And the F is not where the word ends. But if you ever look at it, it actually only has, what, six commands? Yep. It's interesting to look at that language and think about a Turing machine. That's if a language, exactly if a language can be so simple and be Turing complete, it, it's almost a testament to the idea that a Turing machine can compute any algorithm. So every machine in modern day is a Turing machine. Well, how did that happen? Hasn't anybody come up with another idea? Are we all just riding coattails here? Well, possibly. Maybe we could come up with something more uh, complex, but what for? We're starting with something simple and adding complexity as we need it. The only thing out there that really is floating around is quantum computing. And quantum computing, really, uh, it's not solving a need that isn't solved. We can compute any algorithm already with a Turing machine. Quantum computing offers other benefits, and that's possibly time. The computational capacity of these machines could be infinitely greater. But as of right now, we don't know that there are working quantum machines out there, but we have working quantum software, interestingly enough, and that's beyond the scope of this for sure, but I think that's my last slide. Anyway, if anybody is interested in assembly, or even just the analysis of Turing completeness in a programming language, and anyone who writes their own programming language should be, then Turing machines are something that you should have a handle on. And I've never seen a presentation on one, so I thought I'd throw it out there. Any questions? None? Okay. All right.